Good evening. LCC, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, if this is your normal Wednesday night worship spot, welcome. Um, and if it's not, if you're here for the Alpha Omega Conference and, and this isn't your home church, we'd love to welcome you to Little Country Church. Um, this is normally a slot where we'd have our, our weeknight Bible study, but tonight we're going to put that on pause. And we're, gonna, we're really happy to host the Alpha Omega Conference again this year. So... Um, yeah, so at this site, we'll have a session tonight from 6.30 um, until about 8.30, and then tomorrow night as well. Uh, Thursday night, we'll, we'll be in the same spot. So thanks for being here. It's going to be a great night. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just pray for our evening today, and then we're going to jump right into it. Um, what to expect? We're going to have uh, two speakers tonight, and, uh, and then we'll cut you loose for tomorrow night. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, what you've provided tonight in a, in, a, in a warm space, a safe space for us to meet, to gather, to learn uh, from your word and from just two wise men who you've entrusted with uh, their gifts of teaching God. So uh, we're grateful to be here. We're grateful to uh, just, yeah, learn what your spirit would have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, first we have Professor Tom Meyer from uh, Shasta Bible College, the Bible memory man. He's going to go first. Welcome, Tom Meyer. I haven't said anything yet. It's great to be here, everybody. Well, Johnny Carson always told his audience what he was going to do, and then he did it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do it. <laughs> the first thing I'm going to do is give a brief introduction to the book of 2 Peter. Then number two, recite the book of 2 Peter from memory. And then number, it's only three chapters. <laughs> and then number three, what we want to do with the time remaining is we want to work verse by verse through chapter three and talk about the most important event in human history to come that which all of history is moving like a mighty river towards, the glorious second coming of Jesus. Amen is right. Second Peter was written somewhere around 66 AD, a good generation after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel had gone forth from Jerusalem, the fountainhead of the faith, a little bit south to Judea, then a little bit north to Samaria, and then from there it started to make its way into the uttermost parts of the earth. Thanks to Roman technology at the time, the evangelists were able to harness this newly paved Highway 80, Highway 5, Highway 44s, and 299s to bring the gospel to places it maybe couldn't have been brought a generation or two earlier because of this Roman road system. So about 66, according to church tradition, Thomas, which is a good name, right? Uh, Thomas had brought the gospel to India according to church tradition by this time. Mark had brought the gospel to North Africa, all the way to Morocco. Paul, way, way deep in Europe, deep into Roman territory. So long story short, the gospel is presenting itself as a tremendous threat to the government, <laughs> to the Roman Empire, because at this time in the Roman Empire, your average Joe Blow would have had to worship Caesar as the son of God. God. And Christians, uh-uh. <laughs> They're not going to worship Caesar as the son of God. So, as you know, things start to boil over. Christians start to get beheaded, fed to wild animals. They're on the run. It's hot in the kitchen. They're getting persecuted left and right. And someone in the government... <clears throat> <laughs> Someone in the government had this wonderful idea. If we can arrest one of their ringleaders, we would call them a pillar, Peter, and publicly execute him, this will put the fear of Caesar into all these Christians and then for once and for all will wipe out this newfound faith. So Peter, as you hear this, is incarcerated. He's in prison. He's either in Rome or Babylon, depending on how you interpret that, one of the two. And literally, as we're going to hear, any minute he's going to be executed, publicly executed, along with his wife, in the center of town square in Babylon or Rome. And he's got one last message to the church then and to the church today. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, and we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty." For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him on the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereon you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But there were false prophets among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with fiend words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. He condemned them with an overthrow making them an example unto those that later should live ungodly. And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of punishment but chiefly then that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of those things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward 
of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime spots they are, blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. They are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom is reserved the midst of darkness forever. For while they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that are clean escape from them that live in error. For while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of this world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and in the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come is a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? Looking for hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blemish and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of which some things are hard to be understood, <laughs> which they that are unlearned and unstable twist as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. But you therefore, beloved, seeing you've known these things before, beware 
lest you also be led away from the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to do the book of Revelation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe a different time. Where's Mike at? I told Mike, you should have me come and do Revelation at the men's meeting. Wouldn't that be nice? Just to sit there and hear it. Whew. In 58 minutes, and then we can talk about it. Well, let's talk about 2 Peter. We want to go through verses 1 through 11 to the best of our ability tonight. 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 7. In verses 1 through 7, Peter is going to describe to us the denial of the second coming of Christ in the last days in verses one through seven. Now within verses one through seven, he wants to zoom in a little bit tighter on verses one and two. In verses one and two, he's gonna explain to us the purpose of the epistle. Let's go there, chapter three, verse number one. I am on page 13, 19 in my Bible. Verse number one, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. Let's pause real quick. Obviously, the first epistle is 1 Peter. And who is he writing to? Obviously, he's writing to us by application today, but his original audience, if you look back in 1 Peter, it was the churches in the province of Galatia. So kind of think of biblical Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And within that country, there was different states and different provinces. And he's writing to a cluster of churches that are kind of like all up and down Highway 5 between Sacramento. Should we include Mount Shasta? We'll include Mount Shasta. Okay, between Sacramento and Mount Shasta. All these churches in this region. Now, Peter loves these churches, and these churches love Peter. It's reciprocal. Maybe he helped plant these charges. Maybe he helped get them going. But they love him, and he loves them. And because of this existing relationship, he can be quite frank with it. Can we be frank tonight? Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So this second epistle, beloved. Now, what does that mean, beloved? These people he's writing to in, in the province of Galatia. Well, it's the Greek word. We're going to do a little Greek tonight. Just, is that okay? A little Greek? Just a little bit. It's the word agapetos. Can we try that? Agapetos? Mm, okay. Pretty good. <laughs> and it means the ones near and dear to my heart. The ones near and dear to my heart. So he says, I now write on to you. I think that adverb now can infer that he's writing Second Peter, kind of right after the ink of First Peter has dried because he knows he's going to get crucified literally in the center of town square in Rome at any second. Back in chapter one, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. And that word for shortly means quickly, very quickly. Like in John 21, remember how in John 21, Jesus told Peter how he's going to die. Remember that? Didn't you guys go to Sunday school? <laughs> I now write on to you. Okay, so what's his purpose then? He wants to stir up their pure minds by way of remembrance. What does that mean? Well, when you think of a pure mind, don't think of pure as the driven snow. Think of, and this is going to be important, think of sincere, think of dedicated, think of these people are not Christmas, Easter kind. Was church packed Sunday, by the way? Yeah, that's good. They're not Christmas Easter people. These are people who have got skin in the game. They actually believe the gospel and they're trying the best they can in this crazy world to make a mark for God's glory. That'll be important. So it's these people who've got skin in the game that he wants to stir them up. What does that mean, stir up? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> it's the Greek word, deagardio. It's not a frozen pizza, okay? Can we try that one, deagardio? Degario. Pretty good. <laughs> and it means something like this. Let's say Pastor Brian was home, okay? And let's say I knew that the church was on fire, and I ran up Pastor Brian's house, and I kicked down the front door, grab him, and I say, Pastor, wake up! Wake up! Like with that kind of oomph. That's what the word's getting at. In other words, these believers who are just like us, who've got skin in the game, in the context here, they're sound asleep. Sound asleep. The last thing they think about every day is that Jesus might come. It's true. You know how it is. 
Wednesday, we've got classical conversation. Wednesday night, we got youth group. Thursday is lady Bible study. Friday's this. Saturday, we're doing that. Monday's this. And, and you just go day by day, week by week, and month by month. And you very probably rarely think, what if he really did come today? Like, really? What if he did come? And these people aren't thinking like that. And they're not practicing like that. And it's Peter's job to be that that alarm clock <laughs> to wake these people up. How's he gonna do it, Tom? Well, thanks for asking. By way of remembrance. In other words, he's not telling them something they don't already know, just like you people. They just need to be reminded. Verse number two, what's the means, the mechanism, the tool that's gonna wake these people up? Verse two, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets. Let's pin up that thought for a second. Notice by application, it's you, not Pastor Brian, not Pastor Mike, not Daniel, not Dr. Nicholas, not your spouse. You are the one who have to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You're the one who has to give an account of what in the world you have done or not done with this. This is the means, the mechanism, the only truth. You can't trust stats, can't trust polls, can't trust anything, can't trust the news. All you can trust is this, Right? Am I in the right place? Yes. <laughs> it's this. And he says, that which was written by the prophets. In other words, he says, you need to go back to the Old Testament and look at those 2,000 plus, not necessarily verses, but statements, 2,000 statements just in the Old Testament that talk about not the rapture, but the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that wasn't enough, which takes a lifetime of study, by the way, you should come to my class on Monday night at Shasta Bible. Do you like this so far? Are we doing okay? <laughs> on Monday nights, I teach like this, but not this. It's more like that. It's at six o'clock. You should come on Monday. Just pop in. We're going through Job. If you like it, stay. If you don't, we'll still love you. But stop by Monday night. Anyways, if that wasn't enough, he says, oh, by the way, that which was written by the apostles. In other words, at this time, guys, they didn't have this like you have that. They didn't have the New Testament like we have it. I think Revelation isn't put in here. It doesn't mean it wasn't recognized as inspired, but it wasn't put in here until like 300 years. The Council of Nicaea, right? 324. It took 300 years for them to figure out to put that in here. That's a long time. That's older than America. But they did have New Testament epistles. Remember at the end of it, you just heard it, that which was written by the Apostle Paul. They had Paul's letters. They had Peter's letters. And if they had Paul and Peter, you know they had James and John and everybody else. This is what teaches you the truth. Go on. Verse number three. Well, knowing this first, pause. That's a literary device Peter uses to underline the importance of what's coming next, those three English words, knowing this first. He does it at the end of chapter one. At the end of one, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private, now my translation says interpretation. A better translation would be Genesis. So, hello, people of Reading. Prophecy doesn't come from you. <laughs> it comes from God. <laughs> Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private genesis. Anyways, verse number three. Knowing this first, so whatever he's saying is gonna come next. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. Now, are we living in the last days? You better believe you are. Actually, technically, you've been living in the last days the last 2,000 years. First John chapter two, verse 17 and following, he says, Little, tell me if you think John believes, like he believes what he's talking about, okay? Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Do you think he thinks like this is the ninth inning? If that was the ninth inning, which it was, you're totally, in, you're like in the 20th inning or whatever. You're there. I spent five years in Jerusalem studying there and did a lot of research there as a student, whatever. In the 1830s, there was only 7,000 Jews in all of Israel. It's like Palisadro. <laughs> in all of Israel, there's 7,000 Jews. It went up to 700,000 in the 1940s, and today it's 7 million. 
Can you imagine being alive 100 years ago and someone would say, oh, do you know what? 100 years from now, there's gonna be a Jewish state for the first time in 2,000 years. There's gonna be a capital. There's gonna be all this stuff and uh, over half of all the Jews, two thirds of the Jews in the entire world are gonna move back there. That's like actors on the stage kind of stuff. That's like curtains wiggling kind of stuff. Like we're right smack dab there. So what's gonna come in the last days? Well, there's a group of people coming called scoffers in verse three. What's a scoffer? Scoffer is someone who derides, who ridicules, who tears to shreds the doctrines and the teachings of the greatest importance. Things like, in the, you know, uh, in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is therein. Oh, no, he didn't. And believe me, I have relatives like this, right? <laughs> so I have to deal with this. No, he didn't make it in six days, you know. No, no, no. It took billions and billions of years, and you went from ooh to the zoo to you by a series of time and chance, and somehow, some way, you ended up from a great ape to you. And that's what you get for $45,000 a year at Wheaton College. Whereas you could spend a quarter of that and come to Shasta Bible College. <laughs> People who deride, ridicule, tear to shreds. Doctrines of the teeth. Virgin conception, eh. Six days, eh. That kind of people. Well, here's an example of their scoffing as we hasten along in verse number four. They say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Or in other words, what these people who are under the umbrella of Christianity supposedly are saying is that we don't live in a moral universe. You can do what you want, when you want, with who you want. And God is love. God has never, ever, ever supernaturally intervened into space-time history and judged the world on a global scale. He's never done it, and he never will. Oh. Well, let's go down to verse number five and see the error of their thinking. But this they willingly are ignorant of. What does that mean? Thanks for asking. You've got a Bible open, they've got a Bible open. Did you read it? Yep. Do you understand it? Oh, yeah. Do you believe it? Oh, no. <laughs> That's what, exactly what it means. What are they willingly ignorant of? Because of the hardness of their heart. And this, we have friends like this, don't we? We have relatives like this who just won't trust God. Just take him at his word. That's all he wants you to do. I have three, ki four kids between three and eight. And you just need to have faith like that. Just faith like them. Just believe. That's all. Well, Let's go down to verse number five. What are they willingly ignorant of? That by, now, this is a hard verse, so let me say it and unpack it. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Huh? <laughs> it means something like this. The same power, the same tool, the same mechanism God used to create the world, namely his word, that's the same tool, that's the same mechanism that he's used to bring about the end of what Peter calls here the world that then was. I.e., yes, God did supernaturally intervene into space-time history once on a global scale. What was the world like before the flood? Very little data is given, as you know. You got seven verses in Genesis 6. It was so, you think it's bad now, and it's bad but you think it's bad now, listen to this. In every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. It was so bad that it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Whew. Slaughtered them all. That better be God calling. And Jesus says a little bit, and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, where he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Men are eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the flood came and took them all away. So wait a second, Jesus. If, what's so wrong with that? That's what the world was like before the flood. Does anyone like to eat? Does anyone, be careful, it's a Calvary Chapel. Anyone like to drink? <laughs> anyone like to be married? Give it a, of course. So what does that mean if that's what the world, that was the spiritual parameter of the world at that time? I think what he was getting at, it's all me, 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 I, 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 greed, selfishness. There's no room for God in people's lives. 83% of Americans do not, I say, do not go to church on the weekend. The 17% who do go to church on the weekend, church can mean whatever in the world you want it to mean. 
anything, any ism, whatever. And he forecasts, Barna, by 10 years from now, when my kids are in high school and your kids or whatever, that not 17% of Americans will go to church, but 10% of Americans will go to church. And that's where we're at. That was the first world that perished, Peter talks about right there in verse number six. That was from creation to the flood, the world that then was, according to Usher's chronology, 1,656 years. Then Pete, that's world one. Then world three, which we won't get to, but he touches on in verse number 13. That's from the second coming of Christ throughout the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20. But what about world two? The here and the now, that's verse seven. Anyone who's ever lived on God's green earth from the day Noah walked out of that box with his seven other family members to this very second lives in verse number seven. The heavens and the earth, which are now, got it, by the same word, what word? The word that created everything in six days? The word that was born in a manger? That word, what did he do? Well, verse number nine. I'm sorry, verse number seven. They're kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God's got the whole thing under control and he is going to one more time supernaturally intervene into space-time history at the second coming of Christ. But this time it's not gonna be a global flood and you know a little bit about this. It's gonna be fire. Wrath. But don't worry you're taking before that happens. Let's get down to verses eight through 11 as we finish up. We'll be done on time and under budget, I promise. I'm very German. (laughs) Verse number eight, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It's hot in the kitchen. These people are struggling. People are getting beheaded, thrown to lions, losing their jobs. It's hard. People just want to throw in the towel and just quit. It's not worth it. But he's saying, beloved, the one's near and dear to my heart, don't do that. Don't give up on God. He's not going to give up on you. Because a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. In other words, God's got it all under control. He has a plan. You do your part. Let him do his part. Go on. Verse number nine, why shouldn't I throw in the towel? Why shouldn't I give up? Why should I double down my efforts to serve the living God right now? Because in verse number nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. What does that mean? It means that men are liars. (laughs) Oh, you would like to borrow a quarter of a million dollars to to build this house? Please sign here in blood because I don't believe that you are gonna give me back the money. You can't trust people, sworn statements, bonds, affidavits, lawyers. You can't trust anything. You can't trust polls. You can't trust stats. You can't trust the newspaper. You can't even trust the record searchlight. (laughs) But you can trust God's word. He's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. And you know why he hasn't come back yet, according to the second part of this verse? Because he's not willing that anyone should perish. You know, before when I was single and whatever, I went seven, just between friends, I went 700 days in a row. And I wouldn't go to bed until I told someone the gospel with my mouth or gave them a track. And then some liar in Israel told me I couldn't do it there. And then I broke the streak. But then, ha ha, I went back to Israel and evangelized your whole country. So take that. <laughs> but like, what happened? Like, why don't I do it as much as I used to do it? You know what I'm talking, when's the last time you invited someone to church? Hmm? When's the last time you left a gospel track at a meal? Hmm? You know what I'm talking about? It's just, you just lose that first love. Do you, you understand? Can you have some sympathy here? This is something that is not good because we need to do our part as you know. These are things angels desire to look into. That's why he hasn't come back yet, according to the second part of verse number nine, because he's not done saving the people he's going to save. Two more and we'll be done. Verse 10. But, or in other words, even though it's long delayed and it's 2,000 years, and he said, I'm coming quickly and I'm coming shortly, but the day of the Lord will come. It is a certainty that it's going to happen. What does that mean, day of the Lord? Just think of like Revelation 6 to 19. 
that stuff. Seals, trumpets, bulls, judgments, wrath, that kind of stuff. The day of the Lord will come. The second coming will come. How's it going to come? He tells us right here. Is a thief in the night. This is not the rapture. This is the second coming. Those are two different things. The second coming is going to come suddenly. It's going to come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. The world's worst nightmare. You're home alone. Someone breaks in. Not good. Not good. And you put that on a global scale. Whew. What accompanies the second coming of Christ? He tells us right here in verse number 10, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Pause. That word for great noise in Greek is rosodon. Can we try that? Rosodon. We have a Greek class at Shasta Bible College. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> and it mean, it's not used in the Bible a lot, but outside the Bible, it's used a lot. It's used as the sound of a, I don't want to do it to you guys because we haven't taken the offering yet. <laughs> Shoot an arrow at you. <laughs> that whiz. <laughs> it's used as a sound of a roaring, crackling fire that's going to devour your home. It's used as a sound of, does anyone not like snakes? It's used as a sound of a killer snake. That's got the, Any sound of terror, any sound of horror, you put that together and that's exactly what it's going to come look like when the Lord Jesus Christ returns because the one they blaspheme day and night is going to come and judge them. And then it's too late to settle the score. Heavens will pass away with a great noise. Elements shall melt with fervent heat. What does elements mean? It means things that stand in a row like a periodical table, like an alphabet. The whole universe he's holding together right now. When he comes back, the last word there says it's going to melt. In Greek, it means to let loose or to unleash everything he's holding together right now. Boom. But I don't want to leave you on that note. <laughs> Verse number 11. I told you we'd be done by 7.15. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Everything's going to be destroyed by fire. Do we know a little bit about that? Huh? Everything's going to be destroyed by fire. You brought nothing into this world, and I guarantee you, you're going to bring nothing out. All these things are going to be dissolved. Question. What manner of person ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? Pause. My mom died um, five years ago. She was only 61, very young, finally getting grandchildren, <laughs> you know. Young, pretty, happy, and then out of nowhere, just out of nowhere, she got sick, couldn't hold her food down, misdiagnosed, long story short, I'm sorry, Deborah, you have stage four inoperable liver cancer. You're gonna be dead by Christmas Day. There's nothing we can do for you. So we do our part, we pray, we fast, we do everything we're supposed to do, right? But nothing, nothing. But I'll tell you what, even though she loved the Lord and did the best she could in this crazy world, she read her Bible, prayed every day. She even came to church on Wednesday night. She was like that kind of person, <laughs> you know, right? She began to do one thing because she knew any day she had to stand before the living God who's a consuming fire and give an account for her life. Now, I know there's no fear in love and perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. I know that, but it's still God. And she knows she has to get right up here and stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged. So you know what she did those last six, eight, nine months? Focus. Focus. In the light of eternity, is this important? No. Is this? Yes. Pray, love, give, put right what went wrong. Just make the greatest mark you can on the world for God's glory while you still can. Because you want to hear, and she wanted to hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into this kingdom which I prepared for you. And how she behaved those last six, eight, whatever months, that's how you should be behaving and I should be behaving right now. Because you know Why? First of all, last time I checked, it says don't boast yourself of tomorrow because you don't know what the day is going to bring forth. But beyond that, the theme of this conference, the reason you should be living like that is he can come and take you tonight. He can come take his girl, take his bride, back to the house he's building for her, and then that's it. That's it. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you how powerful it is and how clear it is. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight who doesn't know for sure that they're going to go to heaven, they can. They just have to believe in their heart that Jesus died for their sins according to the scriptures.
that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Lord, give us some focus and some determination to live the best we can for you with whatever time we've got back. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Real quick. Thank you. As you, not now, but later, <laughs> when you go out in the foyer, there's some goodies. Th that was 11 verses. This is 14 hours of going verse by verse by verse by verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation. I have the whole book memorized and two master's degrees from Jerusalem. When you put that all together, my wife says it's good. Speaking of Israel, this is a DVD course. It's a teaching course. There's four movies in here. It's over four hours long. All the archaeology, I have a master's in that too. Geography, history of the Holy Land. We go to Jericho. Here's what they found at Jericho. Oh, look at 1400 BC, a gigantic ash layer. Hmm. That kind of fun stuff. Great for all ages, especially homeschoolers. Bible commentaries, verse by verse by verse. Through. I've got 25 or 30 different books out there, Revelation, whatever. And then I've got a few of these because I like to memorize. It's called the Memorization Study Bible. It takes everything I ever learned about memorization and packages it up just for you or your kids or your grandkids. Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, he stole my thunder on the books. We, we would love to support Tom um, by, by, by buying his books out there. So as you leave the, the worship center tonight, it'll be on your left. I'm going to invite Dr. Nicholas up to get his uh, trombone ready, and I will get your laptop. We just need a little segue here, and my skills in vamping are not practiced, but that's all right. This is Dr. Nicholas. He's going he's gonna, to um, serenade us. No, not really. He's going to worship with us through his trombone playing tonight, and then he's going to teach us, so we're going to do both. Perfect. I'll take that. I do. All right, let's see how I did. Did it. I did it. All right. Um, yeah, you ready? Anything you want to say before you play for us? I want to say uh, this young man here that just spoke to you, Todd Meyer, is one of our graduates. And we're so proud of him because uh, he has really given his mind to learning the Word of God and expounding it. When he was a student, I told him, I said, Tom, as we travel together to the sound of the chapter, I always let him. Quote a book of the Bible. Mike. I let him quote the, quote a book of the Bible. He, he would quote Joel and, and other minor prophets, Jonah, and did such a great job. I told him one time, I said, Tom, if you uh, continue to memorize scripture and then after memorizing it, begin to expound it, exegete it, you'll never be without a place to minister. And he's booked every Sunday somewhere whether it's in the Midwest, or the East Coast, or here in, here in Southern California, or Northern California, he is preaching at some church. So he's one of our graduates, we're, we're proud of him, and uh, pray God will continue to use him. You know, we have an interesting challenge ahead of us in the days come, to come. Uh, our country is not in good shape right now. Decisions have been made that makes some of us really discern, concerned and even at times angry because things are being done that just don't make sense. But we might remind ourselves that God is in control. Nothing takes him by surprise because Ephesians 11 says he works all things after the counsel of his divine will. All things means all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But there are people out there who don't know who don't know Christ. And they're concerned too. They're getting disoriented. They want answers. And we have the answers to give them. In the New Testament, in the book of Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 37. And at this point, can you start the music? <clears throat> Thank you. 
And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and was standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head and began kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who was touching him, that she is a sinner.
Thank you. So Glenn's going to come up and get you mic'd up for your teaching. And I'm going to share about um, our love offering that we're going to give for the Alpha Omega Conference. Um, usually at this time, we would pass our baskets around and, and receive that offering for, for Shasta Bible College and for the Alpha Omega Conference. But since we're not um, receiving offering in that way right now because of certain restrictions, you're going to uh, see the two boxes as you exit today. If you exit out of these doors and go through the glass doors, there are going to be two um, offering towers is what we call them. And in those towers, you can place um, anything that you'd love to bless Shasta Bible College with or the Alpha Omega Conference. Um, there's a specific way that we need you to do that, though. There are some envelopes available at the info counter, and we need you to just write Alpha Omega or Shasta Bible College on that envelope. If you write a check out, it needs to be made out to Shasta Bible College. Anything that's unlabeled that goes into those towers tonight is just going to go into our normal offering. Uh, but if you want to make a special love offering to uh, Shasta Bible College or to Alpha Omega Conference for putting on this conference, um, you can certainly do that. So that is the, the plan for that. Um, we have your other presentation ready too, so as soon as you're ready. What's, let's do this. Let's all just do a quick stand and stretch. It's not a bathroom break. It's just a stand and stretch so that we get another um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes in us, and then uh, we'll be ready for for Dr. Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas is the, the president of this conference, or the director of this conference, and the president of Shasta Bible College, and uh, he is he's the guy. He's filling in for Thomas Ice. If you were expecting to see uh, Dr. Ice tonight, uh, Dr. Nicholas is in his place. So welcome. Come on up. Can we welcome Dr. Dave Nicholas today? All right. Let me see if I'm, am I ready to go here? Not yet. <clears throat> Let's see. There we go. Let me get rid of this one and go to another one. Okay. All right. Years ago, I attended USC. I was in the graduate program there at that mighty institution that used to boast about the power of their Trojan football team. And I was standing in line waiting to register for classes. And uh, I noticed that the biology professor was uh, just a little ways from me, registering people for his class in biology. So I walked over to him and I said, sir, I said, I have a question for you. I said, what is the best argument for evolution that you can give me? He turned to me and thought for a minute and he said, you know, I guess it's, uh, it's this one. It's, it's how it's how alligators or reptiles turned into birds. I said, oh, is that so? Yes, that's so. Well, tell me how it happened. Well, the reptiles um, had to find food and so they would lunge after the food and the ones who could lunge the furthest, you know, seemed to survive. And they'd get up on a rock and lunge to find their food and then they catch their prey. And the ones who could lunge the furthest got the prey that they wanted and were able to survive. And in the process, they developed hollow bones. Now, reptilia have solid bones. Birds, if you've ever dissected a bird, uh, you'll find it has hollow bones. But reptilia have solid bones. And that was his answer as to how Reptilia evolved into birds. Now, I heard this morning from one of our speakers on creation, I think it was Dr. Galuza, that, I guess it was Dr., it wasn't Dr. Galuza, it was uh, Dr. Biddle. He was telling us about dinosaurs. And there are people who actually believe that dinosaurs turned into birds. This is really crazy stuff. And people are being taught this in our public schools as the textbooks have not really been revised 
to reflect anything different than they've taught for many, many years. I was in junior high school, and for the first time I was faced with a professor or a teacher that wanted me to do a report on evolution. In fact, he wanted uh, most of the class to give a little report on their, on their ideas about evolution. So when it came my turn, I got up and I said this. First it was a polywog beginning to begin. Then he was a toad with his tail tucked in. Then he was a monkey of a bam jam tree. Then he was a doctor with a PhD. <laughs> a polywog, a toad, a monkey, and a man. Glory be to nature for her great big plan. And I sat down. Afterwards, he told me, David, he said, I think you're the only one in the class that understands evolution. <laughs> well, I want to speak today on why I believe in the biblical account of creation. Listen, first of all, focus on the importance of creation. Frequently I'm asked, what position does Shasta Bible College take on creation or origins? And some ask that question because so many Christian colleges are either hesitant to take a position or for some reason they believe that creation is no longer an issue. I was told that by a Christian college president one time. Creation is no longer an issue. I didn't agree with him, but that was his position. Others are fearful of getting crosswise with secular accrediting agencies that often take a dim view of any institution that challenges evolution, the sacred cow of secularism. Still others seeking to have it both ways opt for theistic evolution. Now I was taught theistic evolution when I was a student at a Christian college in Santa Barbara. The professor I had was teaching us his view of how we came to be. He believed in what was called threshold evolution, that God started the evolutionary process and at different points in the development of evolutionary change in the things God created, he stepped out on the threshold and tweaked it a little bit so it would be like he wanted it. So I raised my hand, brash freshman that I was, and I said, well, you know, the Bible says the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life and man became, I didn't know Hebrew then, or I should have said, a nephishayim, a living soul. He really had no answer except to tell me, well, that's just one way to express it. He did not take what the Bible said literally about creation. And you'll find that all secular institutions and even some Christian institutions don't want to stick with what the Bible says because of their fear of losing their academic respectability. Now the Bible is God's word. And over the years, people have tried to understand how to how to really resolve the differences between science and what the Bible says about creation. You've read about the famous Scopes trials. Well, years ago, some people tried to come up with an answer called the gap theory. That there was a, a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-1-2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is a consecutive vav or a conjunction and the earth was without form and void, or tovu va bohu, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. They'll say, well, there was a, there was a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. The trouble is that the conjunction there is a consecutive vav, which merely explains the condition of the earth as it was when it came from the hand of the creator. That's the gap theory. Then as time went on, there were those who said, we have to have a longer time for creation because I mean, scientists are saying it takes billions of years for things to develop. I mean, the earth has to be billions of years old. Of course, we learned at this conference that that isn't true. But they came up with a day age theory, you know, that the word 
for day in scripture doesn't necessarily mean a solar day or a 24 hour day. It's more of a figurative term. The problem is that's not true because when the Bible talks about the evening and the morning were the first day, evening and morning were the second day, whenever it's used with a number, it always means a literal day. There's one place in Genesis chapter two that speaks of in the day that God created the heavens and the earth. Now that contextually could be taken to be a period of time and not referring to a literal day. But every other time that day is used, it's yom in the Hebrew, it means a literal solar or 24 hour day. But this day age theory, you know, became popular because people were trying to accommodate the scripture to science. You know, did you know science changes? A lot of things science, can, I mean, science says today, you know, <laughs> they didn't say years ago because they learned better. But there are things in the Bible that have endured over time because the Bible is God's inerrant, infallible word. Did you know that Isaiah said, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth? How did he know the earth was a circle or a sphere? Job says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. I mean, Job is reputed to be the oldest book in the Bible. But folks during Greek and Roman times, you know, thought the earth was supported on the back of a giant tortoise or on the shoulders of Atlas. All those things were believed to be true. And then some people believed that the earth was the center of the universe, the geocentric theory. Copernicus went on the rack for that. And as he was suffering in pain, he said, but it does move <laughs> after he recanted. You know, in the beginning, the serpent in Eden, when God placed Adam and Eve in Eden, the serpent was crafty with God's word. And since then, we have been crafty as well. What did the serpent say? Hath God said, thou shalt not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden? People forget that they practice the same thing that Eve did, disregarding what God has told us. The word of God tells us that God made male and female. In the image of God created he them. He made male and female. He didn't make Adam and Steve or Eve and Genevieve. He made male and female. They're telling us today that we can decide what gender we want to be. That our gender or our sex is fluid. It's an emotional thing. It's, it's what we want to be. Again, hath God said. Let's try it a different way. And as a result, our culture is collapsing with all these immoral deviations that used to be called deviant behavior. When I was at USC, I had a course in deviant behavior. Guess what one of the deviant behaviors was in those days, back in the 60s? It was homosexuality. I didn't take that as my project. I took the Hell's Angels. I thought that was more interesting. So I took my assistant and we drove up to where they hang out off of Highway 10 and we invaded their hangout and asked them questions. And then my wife, Donna, who was in a Biola, she had made friends with a, a girl at Biola who got saved and she used to ride with Sonny Barger. He was the head of the Hell's Angels. Her name was Betty. And so I convinced her to interview Betty, get her on tape, and in my report, in my class on deviant behavior, <laughs> I reported on our findings at the Hells Angels Hangout, and then I played the testimony of Betty. And you know what? I got the gospel into a class at USC on deviant behavior. You know what happened? The Christians came out of the woodwork. No longer were they, were they afraid to say something about their faith. 
But there's always this conflict between Darwin and Jesus. If you watch bumper stickers, you'll see, you know, Darwin having legs there and Jesus beside him. And it's always a tug of war between believing Darwin or believing Jesus. But in the, in the Bible, we have God's perfect eternal word. And man's opinion today, in contrast to what the Bible teaches about creation, is that it involves millions, if not billions of years of earth history. In this case, addition becomes subtraction. Of course, I mentioned the Genesis 1-1, the gap theory, and I told you about that but they feel obligated to accommodate the Bible to science. Let's look at the testimony of Dr. David A. DeWitt, who holds his doctorate. He's director of the Center for Creation Studies at Liberty University. It was, we have, we have one of the men from Liberty speaking now, Dr. Randall, Randall Price. Dr. DeWitt is a biochemist and a neuroscientist whose passion is to defend creation using the word of God. He says as follows, theistic evolution is a significant threat to the Christian church. It undermines the very foundation of the Christian faith and causes people to doubt the truth of scripture. I grew up, he says, as a theistic evolutionist. I was interested in science and was an undergraduate biochemistry major. I believed in God and heard that he was the creator on Sunday, but heard evolution all the other days of the week. I did what seemed the only logical thing which I think so many other Christians do. And that is to try to blend the two together. So I combined them, thinking that evolution was simply the process that God used to create. The same thing I was taught at a Christian college in Santa Barbara, better known as Westmont College. I think people make that compromise because they do not know all the scientific, scientific evidence that calls the theory of evolution into question and they also have not been made aware of the major theological biblical problems that it generates. Psalm 1817 gives us some wise words. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, almost all we hear is revolution in schools and universities, zoos, museums, television, movies, etc. So if we don't teach the implications of evolution and the problems associated with it in our churches, no one will know any different. We gotta tell them what the Bible says and give them the truth. That's what the Alpha Omega Conference is all about when it comes to the creation aspect of it. We have some of the finest men I can find in the country that I bring in. Dr. Randy Galuza is gonna speak here on Sunday. He is now the COO and president of the Institute for Creation Research. You know what his background is? First of all, he's a medical doctor, holds an MD. Secondly, he was a flight surgeon and chief of aerospace medicine in the Air Force and retired as a lieutenant. Thirdly, he's a registered engineer, has an engineering degree. Fourthly, he has a degree from Moody Bible Institute in theology. And fifthly, he has a degree from Harvard in public health, a master's degree from public, in public health. How many have ever heard of Duane Gish? Okay. He was with ICR. He was the one who debated Madeleine Murray O'Hare and most of the major evolutionists across the world. Personal friend of mine. When he was younger, Dr. Galuza was intrigued with what Dr. Gish was doing. He got to know him. And Dr. Gish, who's now with the Lord, personally mentored Dr. Galuza because his aim was not to make a lot of money for himself. His aim was to do what Dr. Gish was doing. And now God has elevated him to be president of the Institute for Creation Research in Dallas, founded by Dr. Henry Morris. He's in a position now to use all that history, all that learning to defend the truth of scripture. And he believes deeply that what the scripture says is true and he can, he can prove it scientifically. You don't wanna miss that on Sunday, it'll be fantastic. 
There were two things, DeWitt says, that really turned me to biblical creation from theistic evolution. The first were the passages that say that the word of the Lord is flawless. I came to realize that I trusted what the Bible says about salvation. I trusted what Jesus, that Jesus rose from the dead that I'm, I'm told in the scripture and that he would cure the lame and the blind and mute and deaf. He turned water into wine. All in an instant, he multiplied the fishes and the loaves. He walked on water. I believed all those miracles that they happened just as it said in scripture. I trusted the Bible in all those places. So why not also in Genesis where it says God created all things by his word in six days? The second highly significant point is that evolution cuts to the heart of the gospel. Evolution absolutely requires death, lots of it, billions of years of it. It requires a struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, billions of years before finally man comes on the scene. Death before man even came on the scene. In this scenario, death is not the enemy, but the very means by which God created everything. Yet the Bible leaves no doubt, the wages of sin is death. Death came into the world through Adam's sin. Therefore, there was no death prior to the fall of man, so consequently, there could be no evolution whatsoever before that time. Did you get that? There was no death until Adam sinned. He says that's what turned him from a evolutionist into a creationist. Now, Shasta Bible College and graduate school, however, stands without apology for both biblical and scientific creation. Why? Because such a position is logically consistent and it squares with both the scientific evidence and objective, critical thinking. We've forgotten what that is today in some, in some quarters of education. It's the outcomes we're concerned about. You know, when I was at USC, they talked about the effective domain and the cognitive domain. The effective domain was how you feel about things and how you turn out. We've moved from a, from a cognitive concern in higher education to an effective concern. They're more concerned about how we turn out when, we're, when we graduate and what we believe. And if we don't believe like the professors that teach us, we're in big trouble. How do I know? Because I have a niece, Madison Brashears, who went to Berkeley. She started at UCSB in Santa Barbara, took two years there, and she finished two and a half years in two years, and then she wanted to go get a prestigious degree at Cal Berkeley, thinking that was the case. She arrived there the night that uh, Antifa arrived on campus and destroyed the student center and began to beat people up. She was crying in her dorm. I called her that night. I said, Maddie, do you want me to come pick you up? And she said, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stick it out. She did. I went to her commencement a year and a half later. I won't even share what I heard at the commencement. It was just not good. But she graduated. And she wrote on a Facebook post after she graduated. She said, I got to thank UC Berkeley for doing what my drama class never could do in high school, making me become something I didn't want to be. She had to write what they wanted to hear or wanted to read and take positions that she didn't want to take to be able to get through UC Berkeley. Now, she didn't cave all the way. She came out with her faith intact. She came out as a conservative, even though conservatives were spit upon and threatened and photographed when they came out of hearing Ben Shapiro speak on campus. They took the pictures of all the conservatives and threatened them and threatened to beat them. I mean, a lot's going on that we don't even know goes on in those liberal campuses. But is it really logical? I mean, do we have any facts to back up what we believe about science and still be biblical? Well, the Bible states that God created Eve, the first female in a special way out of Adam to be Adam's helper and companion. Now, science has no adequate explanation of how gender developed the process of reproduction is marvelous and complex and must have been perfect from the beginning to be successful. <laughs> we can't explain that. Evolution has no answer 
for how a single sex organism could possibly have turned into two completely different sexes. Both sexes would have had to appear simultaneously, yet the reproductive organs and functions of each are completely different. Evolution, evolutionists believe that the sexual separation must have happened numerous times through evolutionary history and completely different types of plants and animals develop different sexes at different times, yet no adequate cause or mechanism has been produced or proposed which can explain how opposite sexes could have developed not even once. Genetics. Biologists have discovered that certain living cells come with a built-in self-destruct mechanism. A certain gene within these cells triggers a sequence of events which cause the death of that cell. This is God's way of renewing, recycling, reshaping, and repairing different parts of an organism. For example, I mentioned the tadpole in my poem, all right? Polywog. For example, as a, as a tadpole turns into a toad, it no longer needs its tail. When the special gene gives the order, the tail cells begin to die. In other words, some living cells contain a gene that signals the death of the cell at its appointed time. Why would evolution develop genes that order death? By definition, such a gene would not aid survival. It wouldn't facilitate the survival of the fittest. How about anatomy? You don't think about your stomach very often. It's kind of automatic that your stomach works, right? You eat food, stomach takes care of it. Well, the stomach is a remarkable organism or organ. It's a bag-like structure that serves as a temporary holding tank for food. The average adult stomach can hold about one and one half quarts of food for three to four hours. During this time, the food is bathed with gastric juices which flow from three types of glands in the wall of the stomach. Amazingly, the stomach digests foods made of materials much tougher than itself. Wow. Scientists found we would have to, do, have to, to boil much of our food in strong acids at 212 degrees Fahrenheit to do what our stomach and intestines do at the normal body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, consider that. You'll hear Dr. Dr. Galusa talk about design. We have a designer who designed us in certain ways, designed our organs in, different, in certain ways, designed our eyesight and our hearing, our tactile functions. One of the most amazing things about the stomach is that it does not digest itself. <laughs> now why? It looks like the stomach should digest itself, but it doesn't. Some of our stomach acids are strong enough to dissolve metal, and yet they do, not, they do not harm our stomach. The primary mechanism which keeps us from dissolving our own stomach is a thin gastric lining which continuously oozes a mucus coating. The mucus, somewhat alkaline, neutralizes the acid at the stomach wall and helps keep the stomach from digesting itself. The lining of the stomach sheds one half million cells every minute and replaces them so quickly that we have what amounts to a new lining every three days. The stomach truly shows evidence of design. Then there's astronomy. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9, and that's true. A good example of this is the knowledge of astronomy which the ancient Mayans of Central America had. These people built numerous observatories like the one found at Chechen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula. The Mayan people seem to have been focused on charting the paths of the stars and planets. Their ancient astronomers devised an accurate cosmic clock to predict the solstices of the equinoxes. Their mathematics and astronomical calculations were so precise that they were able to figure the length of a solar year to within two to ten thousandths of a day. The Mayans calculated the length of each year at 365.2420 days. 
Did you know that only recently astronomers have been able to calculate the solar year with any greater accuracy at 365, 2422 days? That's how accurate they were. Every civilization seems to have had to have, have suddenly popped into existence about 5,000 years ago, exactly when the Bible states that the worldwide flood ended and people spread across the face of the earth. Ancient civilizations such as the Mayans showed amazing intelligence and ingenuity from the very outset. So the words of the Bible prove to be true time and time again. And then history. According to the Bible, man and dinosaur lived on the earth at the same time. Dr. Biddle mentioned that this morning. According to evolution, dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago and ape-like creatures turned human only one to four million years ago. Yet virtually every culture on earth has stories about creatures which sound exactly like dinosaurs, which range from cave drawings in the Grand Canyon, the carvings found on Central American stone artifacts, eyewitness accounts in Italy, Ireland, India, China, Arabia, Australia, indicate that dinosaurs were pretty clearly known by mankind at the time this passage was written. Job wrote this passage. Here's what he says. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and feeds, which I made along with you and feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what great power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a giant cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close knit. His bones and tubes are of, of bronze. Under the lotus plants he lies. When the river rages, he's not alarmed. He is secure, though the Jordan should, sure, should surge against his mouth. He's so big, he doesn't worry about a thing. You know, these are marvelous things we learn about creation. Science confirms, when properly understood, what the Bible says. It begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But you know, God has provided us with statements, givens or axioms, if you will, that refute at least six heresies or misconception, all having to do with God and creation. There's a verse I quoted. What the Bible tells us in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, annihilates atheism. In the beginning, what? God. That's presuppositional. In the beginning, God. There you see Richard Dawkins and Chris, Christopher Hutchins, the author of God is Not Great. Hutchins wrote that book, and then Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. You see, atheism is the belief that there was nothing, and nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything, and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits which then turned into dinosaurs. Does that make sense to you? You know, the Bible offers no philosophical argument here for God's existence. There are philosophical arguments, but the Bible doesn't offer that. It just says, in the beginning, God, a presupposition. God's existence is assumed and everything is seen in the light of that assumption. And while there are philosophical arguments that for the existence of God that we teach in systematic theology, such as those which reason from cause to effect, including the cosmological argument, I won't go all through these, but it's just basically every effect has a cause. Hebrews echoes that in Hebrews 3, 4, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. That's basically what Hebrews is saying. That's a cosmological argument. After all, a finite creation beginning a finite creation beginning a finite creation offers no solution to the ultimate cause. It's only logical to expect an infinite cause 
for a finite universe. And theologian Lewis Perry Schaefer of Dallas Seminary years ago said this, reasoning, reasoning from the assumed premise that no God, that there is no God, the atheist is compelled to predicate matter that it is eternal and therefore self-existent. Then there's a teleological argument. We teach this in Shasta Bible College in the doctrine of God. The fact that there is design and purpose or an end in the universe proves that there must be an intelligent designer behind it all. What does Psalm 94, 8 and, 8 and 9 say? Understand, you senseless among the people. Job is kind of tough on people like this. And you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nation, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge? Theologian Henry Thiessen writes, order and useful arrangement imply an intelligent cause. The universe is characterized by order and arrangement. Therefore, the universe has an intelligent cause. So the te teleological argument proves that the first cause possesses an intelligence and is adequate to the production of the universe. And then there's the anthropological argument. Since man has an intellectual, volitional, or moral nature, and since material and unconscious forces cannot produce such a nature, man's creator, therefore, must possess an intellectual, volitional, emotional, and moral nature. In other words, he must be a person. But the presuppositional truth the, the Holy Spirit guided Moses to use was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then next, it prohibits polytheism. In the beginning, God created. The singular form of the verb created tells us that the Hebrews believed in one God, not many gods. There's no evidence that Israel's religion evolved from animism and moved on to polytheism and henotheism before it morphed into ethical monism or monotheism. Israel's monotheism was received as a direct revelation from God. It didn't degenerate. It was first and then degenerated. And it refutes radical materialism. In the beginning, God created. The verb for create used by Moses is bara in the Hebrew, which means to create out of nothing. Radical materialism holds that matter has always existed, but Genesis 1-1 teaches that without pre-existing material, God brought the earth and the heavens into existence. And then it precludes pantheism. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God in his presuppositional statement is clearly distinct from his creation. He's not the creation, he's distinct from the creation. And this continues to be true throughout the remaining, or remainder of the creation account. Christian apologist Norm Geisler, who just passed away recently, who's a friend of mine, said this, the pantheistic concept of God is incoherent. To say God is infinite yet somehow shares his being ex dio with creation is to raise the problem of how the finite can be infinite which is what absolute pantheists say. Otherwise, one must consider the finite world less than real, though existing. And then it nullifies naturalism. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Since the origin of the earth and the universe is supernatural, any kind of naturalistic explanation is contrary to scripture and is consequently inadequate. God, through the divine agent of creation, Jesus Christ, who is the creator, is the architect and creator of all that exists. And Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 17 says this, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then lastly, it humbles human reason. Humbles human reason. Human reason and investigation, while valid, is seriously limited. So the question of origins, therefore, is best and most consistently answered in the light of biblical truth. So think about that tonight. And try your best to attend some of these sessions for these, these men who specialize, you know, in defending the Word of God and exposing the, the errors of evolution, you know, can minister to your heart and give you the ammunition you need to help your, your kids and grandkids and other people, you know, you know, come to realize that we have the ultimate 
answer in the word of God concerning creation of the earth, the universe, and man and all that's in it. Let's pray. Father, we just give thanks for your goodness to us and for the joy of being able to be here at Little Country Church. We think so much of this church and just value its ministry in this area. We value and love Pastor Brian and his staff and his wife. And we just pray we continue to use Little Country Church for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of uh, ministering to these dear people. May you give us a good night's rest and return us tomorrow for more of what you have for us in a conference. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Dr. Nicholas tonight? Church, just a couple things by way of reminder. Tomorrow night at 6.30, we're going to have two more speakers, Dr. Dr. Randy Price and Dan Biddle, I believe. Is that his name? Um, so they'll be here tomorrow night uh, to teach on two more topics. Um, other than that, we will have Dr. Uh, Galuza here on Sunday morning at our normal service times of 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. We're back inside this week, and uh, we'll welcome him on Sunday. Just a reminder, there's giving boxes as you leave today, those towers out there. If you want to give to Shasta Bible College, just make the check out to Shasta Bible College. Um, and if you put uh, cash in an envelope, just go ahead and write Shasta Bible College or Alpha Omega Conference on that for us tonight. And uh, Dr. Or, excuse me, Tom Myers out there at his book table, and uh, he, he would, he'd love to talk to you. So have a great evening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow night or Sunday morning at 8 and 10 o'clock. Thank you, church.